So everybody presumably can hear me and see this. And what I have <laughs> talking about tonight are some selected interviews from the Ingeniums. And Ingenium is the name of the, the consultant driven name by the Canada Science and Technology Museum, which is based in Ottawa. Which, was, which they call From Rock to Reality, an oral history project of mining in Canada. Uh, I'll give you some background on this. Uh, from 2015 to 2018, um, 81 video interviews of leaders in Canadian exploration, mining, and metallurgy were made by the uh, Canada Science and Technology Museum. These are archived and available on uh, their website. Uh, this was a joint project between Ingenium and the Historical Metallurgy Committee of CIM. In these interviews, we concentrated on the over 60 bunch of which I am a proud member. Uh, because we thought we should get the veterans uh, as soon as possible. And it's good we did because a number of the people that we interviewed have since passed away. We were very fortunate to get uh, interviews with people in the over 90 bunch who were movers and drivers in, in fact, international metallurgy in the 50s and 60s. We interviewed academics, labor leaders, uh, working engineers, researchers, native lead leaders, and civil servants. And we funded this uh, through contributions from individuals, corporations, labor and professional societies, supplemented by government grants, which the curator at the museum, Anna Adamack, was very deft in getting. And this is part of Ingenium's uh, Mining and Metallurgy Legacy Project, which I provided the URL. It's a long URL to remember, so <laughs> Google it if you want to look, look at it. And I'll talk a little bit more, but we have in that uh, website at the end. Uh, there is an MHA connection. Uh, I, I became chairperson of the Historical Metallurgy Committee in 2014. I really didn't know what to do to get some fresh ideas. I did a little Google search and found that Eric was in Rochester Institute of Technology. I uh, contacted him, I visited him, and he came and uh, to our organizational meeting and suggested that one of the projects we could consider would be an oral history project. There was one in the United States. And this to me seemed to be quite saleable. I thought I could sell it to get people money since there wasn't anything in Canada. And Canada generally wants things that go on in the US. The current presentation that I'm gonna to give tonight uh, I've basically adopted, it's only slightly changed from a plenary talk I made at the 2017 Conference of Metallurgists about Canada's golden age of metallurgy from 1950 to 1990. And the golden age of metallurgy is a term that we metallurgists use to sort of look back at these times and say that Canada played an outsized role in developments in metallurgy, which is correct. There was lots of public support for metallurgy. Canada was conducting cutting edge research and development in the, in the topics, both physical and uh, chemical metallurgy. Development, and this had development of innovative far reaching technologies and these efforts produced lasting wealth. So <clears throat> we saw that I wanted to have this report back to the committee, to the, to the society, to show what we got, what they'd gotten for their money. And to do this, uh, I abstracted seven interviews. I looked at all the interviews we had at the time. 
and uh, covering topics such as rise of metallurgy after the Second World War, technology development, experience of women, because of course women were new in the workforce during this time. Uh, what about the impact of labor, health, and then what we might call decline of the golden age. So, so what we have here tonight are abstracts of these interviews which talk about these topics. So the interview one is with Bob Lee. And Bob Lee uh, was a technical guru at Canadian Liquid Air, inventor of the uh, ceramic porous plug, which is used in virtually every steel plant in the world to, um, to stir molten steel. It's also being used in copper now. And he also was a developer of shrouded two years. These are two years in which uh, the, ver the vast amount of heat generated by injecting oxygen into baths is protected by a shroud of natural gas, so it's cool. And he is going to talk about the post-war establishment of Canadian liquid air, his first experience at McGill, and a little bit about the invention of the porous plug. So we can listen to his interview, provided that the, um, the virtual gods are with us. I entered McGill in 1942 towards the end of World War II. And our first uh, assignment there was to uh, have all our COTC uh, U uniform and boots and so on. And we had to go out west harvesting because all the available men were out to the war. And I didn't know anything about far farming. And then I had a team of meal, which I brought, brought out to uh, the field to do some stooking and gathering of uh, the wheat and so on. Jobs were very hard to come by in 1947. And uh, a firm from Paris wanted to set, set up a lab here. Montreal is a good place for it because it's French speaking and so on. And I landed up with a job with a with a liquid that's Canadian liquid air, and I worked for them all my working life. They would have a ladle of steel and they would have an ingot to plunge into the molten steel to mix it up so they get a uniform bath of steel so that they can cast the steel with uniform properties. So wouldn't it be nice if we could use some gases in, in a porous brick and place in the bottom of a ladle and put gases through to stir the bath up. So I, I went to brick manufacturers and I said, I would like a porous brick. And I said, not only porous, but continuous porous so I can put some gas through under pressure. But they showed me the doors and we want to make our bricks as dense as possible so they can last as long as pos possible. In the old days, they call it the Department of Mines. Uh, I had a refractory lab there and I approached them and they said, well, we'll help you to make a porous brick. And we were successful in developing a porous brick, which was usable. And now it is used throughout the world. Okay, our next interview is with Jerry Heffernan. Uh, he's an engineer, businessman, entrepreneur, a pioneer in continuous casting, and one of the early developers of the steel mini mill. Uh, to quote a University of Toronto professor who's a specialist in ferrous metallurgy, he was responsible at least partly or mostly responsible for revolutionizing this aspect of steel making. Uh, Jerry, at the time of the interview, was somewhere in his 90s. I'm not, uh, uh, I meant to check to see if he was still alive. I don't know. 
but he gave quite an animated, very lucid, very interesting interview. And in the snippets you're going to hear, he will talk about mental arithmetic, foundry operation as an art, and the development of continuous casting. I had some great emphasis in, in, in Nelson in the high school. We uh, had a great teacher in mathematics who used to get us to do mental arithmetic for 10 minutes or so before the class, before you came started the class really the beginning of the class. Warm you guys up. And yeah, and warm us up. And he gave us difficult problems. Uh, but we learned all the tricks of mental arithmetic, which stayed with me for a long time. I found a job in the foundry as a metallurgist in the foundry. And it was in transition from wartime supply to uh, new products. And one thing I found was that it was a black art. A metaller would pour a spoonful of metal and judge the temperature, and uh, he was all over the place depending on the light in the place of that one. So I talked to my boss, the president of the company, I said, let me buy an optical fireometer. So he said, okay. So I bought one, and Jimmy, the superintendent of the plant, he was a daughter spot, and he said, oh, they work that. That was his favorite talk every time I came up. Finally got confidence from the melter, from the molders in particular, because I could predict the temperature pretty accurately with the optical pyrometer. And then they did these huge rolling mills to roll them down into uh, size for their blooming mills and, and millet mills. And uh, uh, I would, I, I looked at that stuff and I, you know. <laughs> I could never afford one of those plants, but the huge plants and huge cranes to carry this stuff. So we could run a, a continuous billet through the caster, which was the size we wanted to go directly into, into our bar mill. And it just, our yield went out way up 30 okay. degrees. So we gradually penetrated the high quality market with our bars. And, uh, and we took all that business away from steel mills and I guess the the final killing shot for Bethlehem steel, well, they were big on large structures. But we came up with this business of being able to produce uh, big wide flange beams, 36 inch wide flange beams in a rather simple mill. But with our near shape we cast it looking like a like a big uh, uh, section section of the of the beam, and then we'd roll it down, and our costs were so much lower. Okay, so we move away from this, the period right after the Second World War, and we have a snippets from an interview with Philip Mackey, whom Bill Culver talked about. <clears throat> uh, Philip work in technology development for copper and nickel with Noranda, Falcon Bridge, and Extrata, which of course were basically formed by mergers of companies as the industry consolidated. He's organized many international conferences, industry consultant, and just now he's being inducted in the Canadian Mining Hall of Fame. He talks about technology of the 50s and 60s, the Noranda Process Reactor Development Team, and the Noranda Smelter in Noranda, Quebec. The so-called BOF was just about to come in copper and nickel. It was basically reverberatory furnaces, technologies that used a huge amount of fuel. Um, there was less concern about environment. But over that period, 60s and the end of the 70s, um, new technology to improve fuel efficiency, energy efficiency, sulfur dioxide collection. So a whole new group of processes were developed by companies. So of course, I, I joined um, the team at Miranda in 1969 who were really uh, doing brown, uh, groundbreaking work on new technologies. 
but there might have been 10 individual furnaces, roasters and furnaces that had been in operation. They were in fact placed by one new process. The Naranda organization decided to license the technology to other companies and, um, and also other divisions in Naranda. There were plants built in China that I was involved in. And we had some of the first visits to China in the, um, I guess, late 70s, early 80s. Suppose whether we're building a new bridge or a new building or a new process, there's all kinds of issues have to be taken into account. So it involved thermochemistry, it involved all kinds of heat transfer technology, it involved fuel efficiency, energy. Um, it's actually an enormous undertaking. And, um, and I guess we were successful and the plant is still in operation. Okay, we'll shift gears a little bit. And we have uh, basically talk, uh, have a yeah, woman engineer, Monica Naismith, who will talk about some of her experiences as a woman working in the um, mining world in the uh, 70s through the 90s. She perhaps started in the late 60s. She talks about treatment of zinc residue, experience she had at the Ottawa mill, and some of her experiences as a woman working in the workplace. It was pointed out to me that there is a mountain of uh, ugly black and uh, kind of green uh, looking material uh, by the train tracks. And that my job was to uh, develop a process to uh, treat this. There was a story that uh, when the first uh, shipments went out to uh, CCR, that would be the Canadian copper refiners in Montreal, that uh, the shipment uh, inside the uh, box cars or inside the uh, train wagons uh, heated up and was creating fumes. My job was to uh, find a way to uh, treat this stuff. So I did that over the space of uh, two years. I, uh, uh, through bench scale test work and then uh, a little while later, uh, plant scale testing. I uh, created a uh, process. It recovered the copper and the arsenic in a form that could be recycled in the plant. First of all, got a short-term job through a friend at uh, the Ottawa mill, 100 tons per day. <laughs> My first job was a crusher operator. And uh, so they sent me up into the crusher room and uh, the crusher was a little jaw crusher. It was about this size, about that wide. Whenever uh, there was a rock that got jammed in the, in the crusher, I had a pole. It was a big, heavy steel pole. It was about, I don't know, eight feet long or so. It was heavy. And so I had to bash at this rock and uh, get it out of there. And so anybody that knows what, how a jaw crusher operates, the rocks spit out up, out of there like uh, like you wouldn't believe. They they scared me. I I hadn't uh, have goggles at least. There was no requirement in that little mill for safety equipment. And no, <laughs> I didn't. Throughout your career, how present or absent were women? Oh, they were absent. And you being one of them, um, how uh, were you often the only woman? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was. At Cape Creek, I was the only woman. In many of the uh, labs and little operators' booths and, uh, I don't know, sample prep uh, shacks and so on, there were uh, many uh, pin-up uh, pictures, you know, from Playboy and yeah. other such things. That was, that was commonplace. I remember clearly at Cape Creek, there was one fellow who was kind of bummed and, and he didn't he didn't like me being there. And he said to me, what are you doing here? Why are, why are you working? You don't need to work. Your husband's got a job, hasn't he? I said, yes. But uh, I said, well, I, I like to work. And, uh, but anyway, that was the attitude. 
why should a woman be taking a, a man's job? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe by a man who would be the only breadwinner for his family. So. But at this point, I mean, it, it could be uh, only a woman who's the only breadwinner. Well, bread now winner. for me, it was. After those uh, years of separation, I was a single parent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, the people at the museum who really were quite supportive of this were very, very encouraged when we were able to get an interview with Leo Girard, uh, the uh, labor activist and the uh, international president of the United Steelworkers. Uh, and he talks about the union culture uh, working conditions, workplace safety, and the West Trey explosion and results that happened in Canada probably 20 years ago now or even longer. Leo, of course, was a, uh, a native of Sudbury, Ontario, so he, he grew up in Inco world. I was uh, born into a union family. My, uh, my father, Wilfred Gerard was a volunteer organizer for the Mine Mills Smelter Workers Union. And uh, he got very, very active in the union in the 50s and 60s. And uh, I went to work in the smelter in 1965 at INCO. And for the first couple of years, I uh, wasn't very active in the union. Uh, but I saw that things hadn't changed much, so I got to be active in what was then local 6500. We wanted our folks to be treated like human beings. I mean, if you were in a, for example, if you're on the track gang, uh, they loaded you into the back of a five-ton truck and took you up on the slag dump and dumped you off in the middle of the winter. And you had to keep warm by trying to start a fire in one of the shacks. And uh, if you got into the, in, in those days, if you went into the shack a little too early or a little too often, there was some boss up there that was going to discipline you while you're up there with a 40 and 50 mile an hour wind and 30 below weather. And so uh, in the summer, they actually sent me out on the road, breaking stones off the road. It was kind of a little chess game. So, and, and I hung in and we actually made a difference, made some changes. Yeah. Our union has been running a campaign now since Westray. The Westray disaster that killed 26 people. Those workers called my office while I was national director. And I knew some of them from the Elliott Lake days who said, Leo, the emissions here and the, and the coal dust here is worse we've ever seen. We need a union or else we'll get this cleaned up. I sent an organizer there. Two days after he got there, the mine blew up. 26 workers were killed. No one paid a price, even though there was a Royal Commission who said it was the management's decisions. So we started a campaign called Stop the Killing, the Westray Bill. It took us 10 years. We got the Westray Bill passed federally. It became the law of the land. No one had ever been convicted. We started a program three years ago. We met and have run from coast to coast, saying if you're willfully neglect and someone gets killed, you can be held criminally responsible. Our interest is safe workplace and not putting people in jail. But this now sends a signal to everybody. And we're not going to stop. Okay, our next interview uh, is sort of related to that of Leo Girard's. It's with Bruce Conard, uh, who was a former colleague of mine at INCO and then in Valley. He started his career as a chemist who specialized in thermodynamics and a researcher. He was a vice president of INCO Limited and an authority on metals and human health. And he will talk about some of the experiences with human health and the carcinogenicity of nickel chemicals. There was a fact. The fact of the matter was that in Clitic, in Wales, where we had operated in a nickel refinery since 1904. In about 1930 something, the Inco doctor in clinic, Lindsay Morgan, 
thought there were an awful lot of lung and nasal sinus cancers happening in the workers, in the inkle workers. Some compound was loose. And it turned out to be Ni3S2, nickel subsulfide, is a very aggressive lung and nasal sinus carcinogen. Nickel oxide does the same thing to a much lower extent. But you can imagine if there are two compounds declared as carcinogenic, it's very easy for the misinformed uh, and sometimes for the informed, if they're paid enough by lawyers or copper companies, <laughs> to, to um, make not completely truthful statements. And that causes a great deal of concern among our workers who work with all forms of nickel. And I have worked with union representatives. They are very good people. They, they want the truth behind you know, what's happening in the plants. Do our workers get lung cancer? Yes. Lung cancer is a disease of life. When you have a nickel worker getting, who hasn't been in, in, in with nickel sulfide or nickel oxide, they haven't been exposed to that, and they get lung cancer. Right away, it's, is it caused by nickel? Well, you have to do a, a whole case history of where did he work and what exposures and did he smoke? Oh dear, you know, that's not a happy situation. The man has died. His widow and his children are suffering with the fact that this man has died at 63 years old and they want some form of compensation. And here I am saying, it looks like the workplace where he worked, his exposures were to nickel forms that do not cause cancer. He smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 25 years. It's more likely that the, the smoking cause, that's not what people want to hear. And I know it's not what they want to hear, but it's, it's, it's a, a very difficult social problem. Okay, our last interview that we will look at is with Gary Purdy, who's a professor emeritus and former dean of the McMaster University School of Engineering <clears throat> and an expert in phase transformations and solid state diffusion. And he will talk about how he gained an interest in metallurgy. Uh, the impact of Stelco and Dofasco on forming a metallurgy program at McMaster University, which is in Hamilton, Ontario. And then he will talk about the decline of the metallurgical companies, that is, of course, the, um, the decline of the metallurgical companies with takeovers and consolidations, and how he's seen this impact on universities and students. Inspired by a teacher, Jim Parr, who was a well-known metallurgical researcher. So I did a master's degree in uh, metallurgy in Alberta. That there was a really exciting development of the master, uh, which was a new program. And it was a strong, uh, I would call it a science-based metallurgy and materials program. And uh, particularly a fellow named Jack Kirkaldi, who is a bit of a legend in the uh, materials field. Like well, and Hamilton, again, was a natural place because at that time, the, the major steel and steel companies in Canada were in Hamilton. Uh, Stealth was Stealth, fast yeah. at the time. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, very instrumental in the formation of a metallurgical engineering program at McMaster. They influenced Harry Thode, our first president, very, very clearly. And they, uh, I think, pretty much insisted that there be a, a strong metallurgy component in the engineer, new engineering program at McMaster, which was just under development. And in more recent years, um, DeFasco is still quite active in research. 
and they're doing some very interesting things. But they are now part of the uh, worldwide Mattel Arcelor de Vasco group. And uh, so they have, you know, less impact, I would say, uh, even locally. And uh, Stelco was sold to U.S. Steel, uh, basically some serious problems. So I would say that that's true of the mineral industry in Canada in general. There have been so many uh, purchases of Canadian-based companies by global firms. And I'm talking not just about the steel companies. I think aluminum, for example, has moved. Alcan Labs in Kingston no longer function. Uh, Stelco Research is gone. Uh, ICO, you, could, you can go right across Canada and name one metallurgical company after another, and they'd be purchased and they've been, uh, in many cases, downsized the research capabilities that be moved somewhere else. And has it affected the, the numbers in the, the, the it's, program? It's, it's affected the opportunities for our students in Canada, especially. Absolutely. I mean, where would you go? So I, I really see that as a, a very negative. Mm -hmm. Okay, part of uh, the question that we were trying that I wanted to answer in this um, present, this original presentation, and I'm just including it here for completeness is, what would be the chances of a next golden age of metallurgy in Canada? And uh, here's what I presented at the time, and I have one additional point to add later on. Um, Canada, of course, like the US has a stable economy and society, and Canada has been quite conducive to immigration. And in fact, many of the people I worked with in technology development in the metallurgical world were immigrants to Canada as am I because I was originally from the United States. So that's brought in a lot of people. Good education system, Canada still maintains a good high school education, secondary school education system and good university departments. Uh, but of course the growth in resource consumption has shifted to Asia. Uh, extraction and refining are concentrated there, especially in China. Uh, if you look at the um, where the minerals are coming from, minerals and metals are coming from, whereas Canada used to be one of the top sources of minerals, it's, it's well down the list now. It's well down the list of any primary metals being produced. So it's no longer a dom dominant source of supply. Uh, Canadian large metal producing companies, that is the companies that are independent of, um, of anybody else outside the country, emphasize gold, Varic, Tech, Gold Corp, Agnico Eagle. And uh, the amount of metallurgy in gold is, is, is much smaller than say in steel. The golden age was largely a product of the so-called pioneering age in which we identified the basic science the generation before me identified most of the basic science, and now we're building on it. Uh, whereas Canada used to have a very focused uh, government support on mining and related topics, it's now broadened into other topics and mining no longer claims the dominant space that it did. Uh, technology development has shifted away from mining companies as it had, producing companies as it has in the USA to engineering companies and small and medium enterprises. And actually, if you look at the uh, golden age and how cat development of metallurgy occurred in the country, a lot of it was as a result of war efforts and we have basically been in a, a period of extended peace. And um, war has been good for development of metallurgy. I'm not saying that's right, but it's what it's been. You can look for additional information. You can find these um, all these 81 interviews at this website that I mentioned before. Um, we have two documents about the past that are worth reading. Uh, the development of metallurgy in Canada since 1900. And this is about a 
I don't know, about a 50 page monograph which talks about the development of uh, metallurgy in Canada. It talks about non forest metallurgy as well as forest metallurgy, and it's sort of an overview and, and quite, quite accessible. The second one is about just issued actually this uh, in the summer developments in Canadian hydrometallurgy since 1950. This is a bit more um, technical in nature. Uh, you can learn a lot of hydrometallurgy by reading it, but you don't have to, to understand the developments, but it goes into a bit more detail than the, the first document. And then we have a document that we just put out last year, and it talks about a possible future. And this is called the economic benefits of research and development in the Canadian mining and metallurgy sector. It is written by an economist, Peter Ryan, uh, at the University of Toronto. And not only does it look at the future, it also has case studies about technology development at INCO, technology development at Stelco, at Alcan. It talks in a fair bit of uh, information about the rise of the engineering company Hatch. So the, if you're interested in technology development and how it took place and how it has benefited companies, I can recommend reading this. And in terms of the golden age and its occurrence, um, he points out that an important concept that uh, bodes well for the future is so-called stickiness. That is the people who work for companies like Inco and Stelco and Alcan, when those enterprises disappeared, the people didn't disappear and they can continue to develop technology uh, in the same fields that they were. He also calls for quite a, a, a shared uh, research uh, ecosystem, I guess is the word that consultants use these days in the future. And I don't have any more information for tonight. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions that anyone has. Well, thank you very much, Sam. Questions? Well, I didn't see the raise my hand button. Uh, I have a question for Sam. And it's more about what he didn't say. I'm wondering in the context of a golden age where there's uh, research with companies and a lot of uh, new ideas and innovation, where do you think Chile is with copper right now? Are they just tagging along or is that a place that you could go to find out what's up and coming? Um, okay, I actually have visited a Chilean friend of mine this afternoon who told me that in Chile right now, Codelco only produces 30% of the copper that's coming out of Chile, where it used to be quite the opposite. Uh, much of the development in copper in Chile now is shipped as concentrate to China, to Asia, but more specifically China. If you want to find the developments in the extraction of almost any metals in the world, uh, I think the most active place spending the most amount of money, not always intelligently, but from what I can tell is China. That's where I would look to find it out. I'm afraid that no, many of the of the countries are turning into sources of concentrate as opposed to sources of, of, of finished products. And then of course you'd be talking about milling work. Uh, huge impacts of water in Chile and Argentina and Peru as they try to cope with how to uh, concentrate minerals with salt water or reusing water. But I think that's 
probably where you would find the emphasis. Anyone else? Two, two comments, this is Jack. Uh, I think if you look at the shift of metallurgical processing over the last, uh, let's go back as far as 50 years, I think we have to look very heavily at what has happened in regards to public policy in different countries on environment because most every one of the major metallurgical processes uh, have a heavy involvement with uh, the environment that they're dealing with and the controls and therefore the costs involved. And I think the other thing that uh, is a big concern when you think about a country like Canada, a country like ourselves, one of the things that impedes progress in many respects is we're losing our production base. So we really don't have the uh, internal economics to motivate us. I can make a few comments. Um, so the, the leader in developing methods of alternative methods of copper smelting in the 1960s and 70s were out of Japan, where they had very strict environmental rules and regulations. It clearly drove it. And many of the copper metallurgy programs from that period of time, processes that we now use came out of Japan, or if they didn't originate from Japan, they were, um, they were, they were improved and, and radically changed by, by the Japanese. If you look at what has happened in many Canadian mines, and I think in US mines, I'm not as familiar, we're in a mold mining camp. I mean, the uh, mines in uh, Gaspé, uh, Quebec, um, ran out of ore 30 years ago and they've closed. Uh, Sudbury has challenges with nickel, but we've been mining there since uh, 1888. Uh, so, and I think if you look at many of the U.S. mines, age is catching up with them, and and there is a there is a shortage of production base. Yes. I, I remember going on a tour of the Black Cloud lead zinc mine in Leadville in the mid '90s underground with uh, Sam McGeorge was the plant manager, and he later became no the. No voice or video. No, it's, it's funny. It was yeah. really nice outside. Yeah. He, um, he later became an executive director of the National Mining Hall of Fame. And he told me at that time is between the economics and the environmental regulations, what was killing mining in the U.S., places like Black Cloud, wasn't that they didn't have paying ore, but it was the shutdown of the smelters. You end up having to ship it by truck, then by rail, by ship to Korea or Japan or so far that, you know, you that's what that's what killed them there was you know the smelters were so far away even though you had a good grade ore, you just couldn't make it work and i think that's uh, the, the smelting has been pushed off the you know much of it to third world countries or uh of course th they've all gotten so much better environmentally but people just don't want them I guess I'll just make one further comment. If you look at copper smelting, the revolution in copper smelting occurred because of the environmental constraints. And this actually increased the productivity and the efficiency of the copper smelting processes dramatically as uh, Phil Mackey talked about. Um, uh, when people blame the environment 
for the downfall of the industry. There's some truth to it, but I think it actually was a source of most of the innovation that we've had in the last 40 to 50 years. I'll make a, one comment in response to that because I was at Kennecott in 1973 uh, in the period of time when the first big push to rebuild and I think it, I think it resulted in the Naranda reactor. And my recollection was at the time, while there was something like in the first AFE for capital of $130 million. It was solely on the basis of environmental. I do not recall that there was even a return on capital investment even calculated for it because everybody at that time was saying there isn't any. And so that what's happened is that you've had, yes, you've had it, uh, metallurgical and a lot of methods improvements, but the response to the environment in many respects, you've improved that, but the, re but the reality is you didn't improve the profitability of the company. I don't want to get it. I, th I think we'd have to have a talk about externalities and who was paying for what. I think you still have to look. I'm basing this on conventional economic analysis that every company goes through for major investments and the dollars and cents don't compute on good hard dollar uh, estimating practices. I guess I'll, I'll just chime in with one thought and uh, you know, like, like the U.S. steel industry, um, a lot of the non-ferrous metals uh, plants in uh, the U.S. were aging, uh, smaller scale equipment, uh, old, older technology, lack of automation, and this sort of thing. And, and yeah, they, I think environmental regulation pushed them to, to make uh, decisions, uh, particularly in the smelting end of things for air pollution control. But uh, but they were also all needing a reason to upgrade these plants. Uh, otherwise they were on a, a downhill spiral. I mean, you can see what's, you could take flotation cells just as an example and plot the timeline on those and see how unproductive had we, we would have been if we were staying with the small scale units that we had before. But I think Mike float cells very definitely had a positive economic uh, impact. You could you could you could you could calculate very clearly a, uh, a a favorable return on investment. Well, yeah, I I think that's right. I mean, you you certainly could because of uh, of the uh, looking at the total bottom line on uh, on where uh, you know where uh, economies were going to go. However, had you not done, had you not made those investments, you didn't have a business. Oh, no question. I mean, all you, all you have to do is look at the plant evolution at Bingham and, and a great, it, with, with the, uh, there's no doubt that the concentrator uh, and refinery modernizations over the years have clearly paid for themselves. I mean, you, you have to look at all the smelter closures. I mean, Kennecott uh, was smart at the time to do that, what they did there at uh, the smelter in Salt Lake, because, uh, you know, they're one of the few domestic uh, smelters going. Oh, yeah, no doubt. Even if it, even if it was, uh, even if it didn't have, uh, didn't look very good on paper, uh, it was a survival tactic, too. It helps, to have a world, world. it helps to have a world-class ore body. Yeah, absolutely. That always helps. <laughs> well, 
Well, it's got many years to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Interesting presentation, Sam. Uh, you know, we down down here uh, south of, of your border, our border, uh, we don't always uh, pay as much attention, even historically, as we should to what's been going on in Canada over the years. Well, Chris, thank you. You may, you may, you know, gl glance through some of those old interviews and find something of interest because there are people who talk about quite interesting things that they experienced. And um, I would say that since we, well, if people show up and the museum has an opportunity, they will do oral interviews to get them, but there's no, there's no push to get any more. And I would say that since we, since we did that, those, I probably know of four or five people who've passed away and, and you, you couldn't get their stories anymore. So it was quite timely. And my thought for the Metallurgical Society is you, you do it again in 15 to 20 years to get the next generation of people. Well, thank you very much, Sam. It's always nice to, you know, get out, get outside the U.S. So if anybody else knows anybody else outside the U.S. who would like to give a presentation, um, we've got uh, a presentation on for January. We're not having a nugget next week because it's going to, I mean, next month because it's way too close to Christmas. But January is Cousin Jack, a Cornish mining captain in Iron Country. Um, so we'll get Cornwall and Lake Superior Iron Mining District history then. Uh, but uh, February, March, April, I don't know if we'll go into May or not. We'll, do, we'll see if we've got enough topics. So uh, those are all wide open if anybody would like to make a presentation. Any other final remarks, questions? Well, thank you all for coming and hope you have a good holiday season and we'll see you all next year, I hope, okay? Thank you. Take care, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. <laughs> okay, bye-bye.